Good evening, everyone. Uh, afternoon or good morning, depending on which part of the, the time zone we have caught you in. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be here tonight and to welcome you to this uh, Corbett Center event. And uh, in particular, it's a great pleasure for me to be able to welcome Dr. Andy Andrew Boyd, award-winning author and historian uh, here with me tonight. I'm Professor Greg Kennedy. And we're going to talk to you about the Anglo-American strategic relationship and the path to Pearl Harbor, which obviously on December 7th is quite a fitting thing for us to be doing. So it's a real pleasure to have Andy with us here tonight. I've uh, been a great fan of his books. He has two outstanding books that if you aren't aware of, you should be aware of. The one, uh, Royal Navy and Eastern Waters, Linchpin of Victory from 1935 to 1942. And then uh, more recently, British Naval Intelligence through the 20th century. And both of these are absolutely critical for any understanding of Great Britain and its role in the Pacific. And so it's a, a real pleasure to have him here live and uh, able to take part because I think much of the research that he's produced is uh, fundamental to those of us who want to understand the, the reality of events that take place in uh, that particular part of what is, is generally lumped together to be called the Second World War. So Andy, I gotta leave it uh, over to you and uh, thank you very much again for being with us here tonight. Well, thank you very much and thank you for those kind words and good evening, everybody. I opened my contribution uh, to this event in the year 1937, which I argue marks the beginning of a <clears throat> British strategic journey that initially concluded in mid-1941. Over those four years, Britain abandoned the concept of confronting the full might of the Imperial Japanese Navy in the South China Sea and northward. But it also recognized that control of the Indian Ocean was an inescapable commitment necessary to secure the war potential of its Eastern Empire core, comprising Middle East oil, India and Australasia. Controlling this area not only maximized empire war effort, but provided important geographic advantage. It was a strategic shift to focus on what mattered most in the Eastern theater. I then argue that during the second half of 1941, there was an extraordinary reversal. The Royal Navy abandoned a rational Indian Ocean defensive strategy and instead re-embraced the idea of mounting offensive operations across the South China Sea and ultimately basing forward alongside the Americans in the Philippines. This reversal primarily reflected American influence and pressure. Now, many historians have identified 1937 as a pivotal moment for Britain's Far East strategy. They see the combination of the Japanese invasion of China, the potential en enmity of Italy following the Abyssinian crisis, accelerating German rearmament and initiation of the Axis with the anti comintern Pact, as endorsing a much quoted comment by Admiral Herbert Richmond in 1925 that Britain could not secure a two hemisphere empire with a one hemisphere Navy. There is ample evidence that by the end of 1937, Britain's political and military leaders did indeed view the prospect of simultaneous war with three different enemies across three divergent theaters with growing concern. Furthermore, from this point, they increasingly saw deployment of a competitive fleet to Singapore to conduct a regional trade war with Japan in the Western Pacific as unrealistic, although the need to preserve the confidence of Australia and New Zealand made them reluctant to admit this. It's not surprising, therefore, to find an enduring historical view that the rise of the triple threat eviscerated British strategy for securing its Far East territories and territories and interests through naval power and reduced even relief of Singapore to a hollow gamble. Before considering further how British strategy adjusted to the rising triple threat, it's important to register important qualifications to the worst case projections of the Chiefs of Staff. 
during the two years before the outbreak of the European War in September 1939. These qualifications provide a backdrop to British calculations during this period. First, before 1940, the Japanese threat to British territories beyond the concessions in China remained hypothetical rather than imminent. The Japanese were heavily committed in China and the logistics of attacking Singapore from bases at least 1500 miles away while running the gauntlet of the Royal Navy China fleet submarines were formidable. Secondly, in January 1939, Britain gained perhaps its most important single intelligence insight of the interwar period. Government code and cipher school signals intelligence demonstrated that Japan had rejected German and Italian proposals to extend the existing anti-Soviet pact into a formal military alliance against other powers. Japan informed its partners that its economy relied on access to British and American markets and that it could not afford to alienate these countries. For the present, British fears regarding the triple threat were therefore moderated. Finally, Royal Navy leaders perceived the challenges they faced in conducting simultaneous naval war in European and Eastern theatres in 1938-39 as temporary rather than permanent, and certainly not hopeless. By 1939, they had guarded confidence that British naval rearmament was comfortably matching the combined total of Germany and Japan. Now, while these qualifications offered British leaders some comfort, they did not remove a potential triple threat. Japanese preoccupation with China was unlikely to be permanent and war in Europe could provide irresistible temptation. Naval rearmament might provide adequate insurance against Germany and Japan, but the Royal Navy would struggle to cope with Italy too. At the June 1937 Imperial Conference, the first Sea Lord and Chairman of the Chiefs of Staff, Admiral of the Fleet Sir Only Chatfield, insisted that the core tenets of the, of the traditional Singapore strategy stood. In any confrontation with Japan, Britain would deploy a fleet to the east, sufficient to coerce her into a satisfactory settlement. Within a year, the Munich crisis and accelerating prospect of European war demanded strategic adjustment. Initially, adjustment reflected greater realism about the limits of British naval resources in the period before modernization and rearmament could take effect. The result was a reduced defensive goal for the Far East, evident in Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain's message to the Dominions in March 1939, and the concept of flexible reinforcement defined in parallel by the Deputy Chief of Naval Staff Vice Admiral Sir Andrew Cunningham. Chamberlain reaffirmed that a fleet would deploy to the east if Japan attacked the empire. However, its size would depend on the situation in Europe and it would focus on three goals. Prevention of Japanese operations against Australasia or India, protection of imperial communications and preventing the fall of Singapore. While it's fair to see this as a weakening of British commitment, and the Dominion certainly did so. Concentrating on these three goals marked an important strategic shift. Britain would now focus on the inner core of the Eastern Empire and accept it could not contest Japanese aggression north of Singapore. Meanwhile, the revised Admiralty policy announced by Cunningham stated that the timing and composition of Far East reinforcement to meet a Japanese attack could not be predetermined. It would depend on numerous factors. British naval forces available, Britain's overall strategic situation, Japanese strategy, ambitious and aggressive or confined to commerce raiding, and the attitude of other powers, especially Russia and the United States. This defensive strategy with reduced goals and flexible reinforcement, which evolved through the first months of 1939, was not solely driven by limited resources. It reflected at least equally a changing perception of the risks and opportunities in managing empire security. 
At the 1937 Imperial Conference, Chatfield argued that if necessary, the Mediterranean could be temporarily abandoned to concentrate forces in the Far East. In his view, Britain's Mediterranean assets could always be recovered, whereas the Far East, once lost, could not. By contrast, through early 1939, a consensus gradually emerged within the British leadership that the potential damage in abandoning the Eastern Mediterranean probably matched damage from any current Japanese move. This consensus drew on three arguments, which together implied greater naval priority for the Mediterranean. Although not fully articulated until the end of that year, these arguments resonated in various forms through to 1941 and beyond. The concept of a knockout blow against Italy as weakest member of the Axis, the Balkans as buffer against the Axis, and possibly as a base for offensive operations, and the Eastern Mediterranean as barrier to protect Middle East oil and access routes to the Eastern Empire from the West. The new principles that shall underpin defence of British interests eastward from Malta were agreed by the Committee of Imperial Defence, chaired by Chamberlain on the 2nd of May, 1939. First, the core interests in the Far East were those identified by the Prime Minister in his March message to the Dominions. Secondly, a serious Japanese threat to this core would take time to develop, giving Britain discretion over the size and timing of naval reinforcements. Immediate deployment of a full fleet was not an automatic re prerequisite. This judgment reflected the crucial SIGINT insights into current Japanese thinking. Thirdly, there were now Eastern Mediterranean interests that matched and possibly exceeded all Far East interests beyond the core. Fourthly, there was a trade-off between Eastern Mediterranean and Far East, dictated by relative level of risk and benefit at a given time. The Prime Minister acknowledged this represented a scaling down of previous assurances to the Dominions, but his March message had already made this clear. If Britain was defeated, the Dominions' fate was sealed. Britain would strive to protect them, but must focus on the main enemy and that was Germany. The CID agreed to inform the Americans of this policy shift and Commander T.C. Hampton met the US Navy Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral William Leahy the following month. The French were also advised in the staff talks then underway. In war, the British and French governments would agree appropriate distribution of Royal Navy forces between Mediterranean and Far East in accordance with relative risk. Planning would take account of the extreme option of temporarily abandoning maritime control, maritime control in either region. Chamberlain applied these principles when the Japanese threatened British concession, the British concession at Tianjin the following month. He accepted the advice of the Chiefs of Staff that the maximum fleet Britain could generate was insufficient to operate safely north of Singapore. It followed that Britain could not stop Japan freezing her out of China. And if a fleet deployed to the east, the temptation for Germany and Italy to take advantage in Europe would be irresistible. Sending a less than adequate fleet was pointless. Britain should not therefore risk war for its China trade. If Japan initiated war, that was of course another matter. Meanwhile, through the summer of 1939, the Admiralty updated its war plans, which identified the maximum fleet available to meet Chamberlain's reduced goals in the event of war with Japan. Three battleships, the entire battle cruiser force, and three aircraft carriers must remain in home waters to counter Germany. Withdrawing all major units from the Eastern Mediterranean would enable seven battleships, two aircraft carriers, and substantial supporting forces to reinforce the China fleet if the Japanese deployed south in full force to attack Singapore. However, Admiralty planners were clear that this was a maximum fleet to meet a worst case scenario. The timing and pace of Far East reinforcement 
once Japan opened hostilities, still depended on the comparative level of risk in the Far East and Eastern Mediterranean theatres, in accordance with Cunningham's variable factors. The maximum fleet, therefore, is best viewed as the maximum means available from late 1939, after providing for the home theatre to protect the two boundaries of Britain's Eastern Empire. It was also probably adequate to secure Singapore from the maximum, maximum attack Japan could mount in mid-1939. The policy of minimum and flexible reinforcement sufficient to secure Chamberlain's Eastern Empire Corps was confirmed by the War Cabinet after the outbreak of the European War in September 1939. In briefing this to the Dominions, Winston Churchill, now First Lord of the Admiralty, emphasized three points, which he would further underline on becoming Prime Minister through to 1942. First, Britain could and would protect Australasia against any serious Japanese attack. He insisted that if Britain had to choose between its Middle East interests and defense of Australia, the latter took precedence. Secondly, he emphasized the concept of the fleet in being. The power of a fleet applied simultaneously wherever it had bases, irrespective of location at a given moment. Deterrence rested on the possibility of deployment, not just actuality. Thirdly, ships could not remain idle in wartime, waiting for an attack that might never come. It was the collapse of France in June 1940 and simultaneous entry of Italy into the European war that drastically reduced Britain's scope to maintain a trade-off between Eastern Mediterranean and Far East, offering adequate security for both. The French collapse was not reasonably foreseeable and it's easily forgotten how different Britain's options in the East might have been had France survived. Britain now had to find substantial extra naval resources to secure the Western Mediterranean and counter greater German access to the Atlantic, while the fruits of the rearmament programme were only just beginning to appear. Meanwhile, a strike of the resources of the Western empires in Southeast Asia became more tempting for Japan and her ready access to French Indochina made an attack on Britain an easier proposition. Britain briefly considered withdrawing naval forces from the Eastern Mediterranean. She did not do so, partly for the reasons I identified pre-war, but also because a strong naval presence would discourage Spain, Vichy France and Turkey from joining the Axis. Over the next year, the importance of maintaining a forward position in the Middle East became, became increasingly apparent to Britain's war leadership. It protected the Middle East oil resources on which the economies and war potential of Eastern Empire territories depended, denied the same oil to the Axis and facilitated a potential supply route to Russia through Iran and the Caucasus. A withdrawal to East Africa and the Gulf would bring huge economic and material loss and risk Germany acquiring bases in Spain and Vichy North Africa with serious consequences for the Atlantic battle. A forward position also brought offensive opportunities, tightening the blockade, knocking out Italy and wearing down German air power. This case for forward defense now combined with, rec now combined with recognition that control of the Indian Ocean was also essential, both to sustain the Middle East position and to protect and mobilize the full war potential of the Eastern Empire territories. By summer 1941, Britain judged that with American support and Germany committed in Russia, the United Kingdom homeland was secure. But to contain German power, let alone the wider axis, it must hold the resources and strategic leverage of the whole area stretching from Egypt to Australasia and deny them to its enemies. Naval defense of this space at both ends was an inescapable commitment with the Indian Ocean ranking second only to the Atlantic lifeline in priority. Finding naval resources for both ends of this space, however, was beyond Britain's reach in the second half of 1940 
even the China fleet was a pale shadow of that in 1939, with all its submarines withdrawn to the Mediterranean. The response to the more serious threat from Japan was therefore based on three elements. Political concessions to buy time, reinforcement of land and air forces in Malaya and Singapore, and seeking protective cover from the Americans. If Japan, de if Japan declared war, the only British naval reinforcement would comprise Force H, the new Gibraltar task force, which would deploy to the Indian Ocean to discourage IJN surface raiders. However, in line with Churchill's 1939 promise, the extreme option of withdrawing the Eastern Mediterranean fleet to meet a direct and imminent threat to Australia, or by implication the Indian Ocean, remained extant. Enhancing air and land power in the absence of naval forces to discourage Japanese adventurism while the potential for American support was explored through the winter of 1940-41 was a reasonable short-term policy, especially while Japanese forces remained at a distance and was arguably a natural evolution of Cunningham's flexible reinforcement. Unfortunately, a temporary expedient became an excuse for British leaders to defer fundamental strategic choices. By autumn 1940, increasing Japanese capability and their potential access to Indochina, Thailand, and the Netherlands East Indies meant that to protect and use Singapore as a base, Britain must control a substantial area around it. The air and land forces Britain proposed deploying in 1940 were never sufficient to meet the scale of Japanese attack which intelligence correctly anticipated. And even these inadequate reinforcements were not achieved by December 1941. Adequate forces could only be found by diverting, diverting them from the Middle East. This was never possible in 1941 without putting the Eastern Empire and the oil to sustain it at serious risk from Axis attack in the West undermining Britain's wider ability to prosecute the war. Britain could pursue a forward defence policy in one theatre, but not both. If the Indian Ocean was an inescapable commitment, and Britain's leaders were clear by mid-1941 that it was, then the real choice they, and above all the Admiralty, faced was whether its security really required the use of Singapore. For a while, Britain hoped the United States would solve its problem in the Far East. During the late 1930s, the Anglo-American naval relationship had progressed from rivalry and suspicion to cautious friendship based on perceived common interests, especially regarding the naval threat from Japan. Through the winter of 1940-41, Britain therefore explored whether the Americans would base a substantial fleet at Singapore. Ideally, Britain hoped the US Navy would both substitute for the fleet it could no longer provide itself and embrace pre-1939 Royal Navy plans for securing the China Sea. This approach failed for two reasons. First, it was politically impossible for the US Navy to deploy its primary asset to secure British Empire territory while leaving Hawaii and the United States West Coast exposed. The Americans were also unconvinced Singapore was defensible. Secondly, the collapse of France and the perception that British defeat might follow led the United States to prioritize the Atlantic and even the Mediterranean over the Pacific. This decision was enshrined in their planned dog National Security Memorandum of November 1940 and in the first American-British staff talks, known as ABC-1, the following January. The American commitment to the Atlantic was strongly encouraged by Britain, but she overestimated American power, failing sufficiently to appreciate how this would weaken US naval power in the Pacific. Plan Dog effectively eliminated British hopes that the United States would guard, guard her naval flank in the Far East. 
it obliged Royal Navy leaders to adopt a compromise American proposal at the ABC One talks. The US Navy would relieve sufficient British forces in the Atlantic to enable the Royal Navy to create an Eastern fleet sufficient to secure its vital interests in the East, including Singapore from Japanese attack. Unfortunately, it proved difficult to translate ABC One's strategic principles into practical plans for cooperation in the Far East. Furthermore, through the summer of 1941, the prospect of a new Eastern fleet encouraged Britain further to defer the hard decisions over Far East defense, above all the status of Singapore. Even if air reinforcement and modernization was delayed, the potential resurrection of an Eastern fleet now made holding Singapore, at least in Admiralty minds, both necessary and apparently feasible. The problem was that the primary forces released by American Atlantic substitution, the obsolescent Royal Sovereign class battleships, were quite unsuitable to take on the IJM. The Admiralty was potentially willing to, to embrace a fleet composition it would never accept against the Italians in the Mediterranean and without the substantial British air cover available in that theater. Before September 1941, the creation of this new Eastern fleet remained hypothetical, conditional on American entry into the war. Britain's Eastern theater naval strategy also remained essentially that of late 1939. Both Prime Minister and Admiralty were firmly focused on defense of the Indian Ocean, especially from IJN surface raiders, even if they differed over force composition. Singapore's status as a naval base remained unquestioned, but it would support operations westward, not northward, and its vulnerability in wartime was acknowledged. September brought dramatic change. Following the first Anglo-American summit at Placentia Bay, the US Navy began assuming responsibility for convoy escort in the Western Atlantic, thus releasing Royal Navy units immediately, rather than awaiting the outbreak of war. Establishing an Eastern fleet by the end of the year, drawing on these forces and the growing output of the British rearmament program now looked feasible. In parallel, the US Navy insisted that a Far East joint operating plan based on ABC-1 principles depended on a far stronger British naval commitment to defending the Malay barrier. To encourage more forward British deployment, the Americans stressed their determination now to reinforce the Philippines with substantial air forces and for their Pacific fleet to mount more aggressive operations from Pearl Harbor. Together, these factors persuaded the Admiralty that from early 1942, operating north of Singapore into the South China Sea in accord with mid-1930s war plans was again feasible. By early October, with the acquiescence of the Chiefs of Staff, the Admiralty was actively preparing the deployment of a substantial battle fleet to Singapore, able to operate offensively and ultimately even base under American air cover at Manila. This new intent to create an Eastern fleet at Singapore was not, however, irrevocable. If circumstances changed, certainly if war looked imminent, early reinforcements could concentrate in Ceylon and resume the defensive focus on the Indian Ocean, while the merits and risks of more forward deployment were reviewed. This was the choice faced by the Admiralty in late November, when the new battleship Prince of Wales arrived in Ceylon to join the battlecruiser Repulse and the old battleship Revenge, both already in the Indian Ocean, as the first units of the putative Eastern Fleet. Intelligence now pointed clearly to early hostilities, with Japan capable of deploying sufficient air and naval forces to make British operations north of Singapore highly risky. Operational, operational caution, therefore, dictated holding the Prince of Wales group, foresaid as it became, at Ceylon 
but deterrence rested on Japanese. Sorry, in theory, this conflicted with the prime minister's political desire for a visible naval deterrent to Japan. But deterrence rested on Japanese awareness that significant, that significant reinforcements were in the Far East theater, not on their specific location at Singapore. Sigint showed that Tokyo now knew the Prince of Wales was in the Indian Ocean and bound for Malaya. It's therefore unlikely Churchill would have, would have overruled an admiralty decision pressed by the first sea lord, Admiral of the Fleet, Sir Dudley Pound, to hold her in Ceylon. However, the admiralty did not hold forth said back. Desire to demonstrate British commitment to defending the Malay barrier and bring serious forces to joint operations with the Americans was a factor. It combined with a belief that reversion to traditional and more aggressive war plans against the IJN were desirable and now possible. Pound perhaps also judged that the Japanese would attack Thailand before Malaya, and there was time to review options once forced said. Once forced said was in Singapore and American forces on their flank, especially the powerful US Navy Asiatic Fleet submarines, which might deter Uh, <clears throat> which might provide a significant deterrent. So Tom Phillips and the commander of the US Navy Asiatic Fleet, Admiral Thomas Hart, met in Manila on 6th of December. They agreed that with current resources, their initial approach to an apparently imminent Japanese attack must be defensive, but the planned reinforcements would allow them credibly to contest the South China Sea in the coming months. This was a reckless misjudgment, given their accurate picture of Japanese strength and probable intentions. But it was one broadly shared in London and Washington. It was only partly mitigated by the inability of all involved to anticipate that the Japanese would shortly remove both the US Navy Pacific Fleet and the US Air Force in the, in the Philippines from the board, and that the American Asiatic Submarine Force would prove useless. The subsequent loss of force said, following a vain attempt to disrupt the Japanese landings in Malaya, should not be conflated with an argument that Britain lacked the naval resources to defend its maritime interests in the East. What mattered, as Chamberlain identified in early 1939, was control of the Indian Ocean rather than the Malay barrier. In late 1941, Britain had the potential resources to secure this ocean, but even with maximum American support in the Atlantic and a more aggressive American approach in the Pacific, it could not hold the barrier at this time, even ultimately Singapore, let alone reach beyond it without far greater commitment of air power. There was inadequate um, <clears throat> reinforcement the admiralty's forward strategy adopted in september proposed placing an inappropriate capital ship force in an ex in an exposed position with inadequate air cover where there was sufficient intelligence to show the enemy could bring concentrated force to bear. It was a classic case. It was a classic failure of risk management. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andy. Uh, I put down in the uh, chat box after my uh, presentation. If you have questions, uh, please do put them into the chat box at that point. And please indicate who it is that uh, the question is directed at. So my time I'm going to spend looking more on the American side and particularly looking at the element of economics and its relationship to the maritime domain. 
I think that there are a number of things that have been raised in Andy's uh, presentation that are important to to also you know continue the thread and the vein that he's put them in terms of this idea about collaboration or the variations of frictions that existed between the United States and Great Britain. And I think the question of deterrence is critical to this. If you were trying to paint a perception within your opponent's mind of credibility that will allow deterrence to then therefore take root, how is that best achieved? And quite often the idea is that it is purely one of, of military power. I'd like to argue that in, in many respects, the relationship between naval power and actually Anglo-American control of the greater global maritime domain is where, where the true leverage uh, on Japan lies. And it's quite interesting that the, the one of the key kind of points of friction, I think in terms of of alleviating some of the friction in terms of the ability to create commonality of purpose between Britain and the United States rests in the point that Andy raised about the the um, the triple alliance, the the whole kind of question about what is the relationship between Germany, Italy, and Japan? Is it military or is it not? And to that then was created this point of contact that the British and the Americans could collaborate on to arrive at an answer as to whether or not there was therefore a common set of enemies or a common enemy. And particularly for the United States and its engagement in the greater global affairs. This is, I think, an undervalued appreciation um, or an area of, of, of appreciation that's undervalued by many scholars. And that while it is associated with Roosevelt's um, discussions about you know outlaw rogue states <clears throat> it is not taken i think in the in the right light in the context of understanding that the line particularly that is being drawn is one which connects the united states and its values to britain and its values not just about democracy and the rule of law but also fundamentally about economic power and capitalism and here I think that it's important that China and the role of China be brought in here to the discussion and the relationship between the way in which China is sustained and the need for maritime power to sustain China and it being a critical element in a combined Anglo-American appreciation and therefore a combined Anglo-American strategy as to how to approach the growth of Japanese power while at the same time recognizing that both in the United States due to domestic politics, British to domestic politics, as well as one could argue perhaps the, you know, the imperial overstretch or at least the imperial stretching of limited resources until appeasement can take effect and allow rearmament to build or rebuild and modernize, you need to find a third way. And if you have an Anglo-American agreement that Japan is an opponent and an enemy, which I believe, which I believe actually takes place between 1933 and 1937, before the actual display of Japanese aggression in China, which then when consolidates it in the enemy camp, what you also see therefore is an appreciation of, of how that links to what it was that the main weapon of war against Japan was going to be, which is of course, economic warfare and trade embargoes and sanctions. And many of the things that were applied to Germany in the first world war, but also traditionally applied by Britain in its, in its, relation, in its ability to leverage the two you know, key strategic pillars that it, it has owned for, for quite some time through the Napoleonic Wars and onwards, which is of course, control of global maritime commerce through both the Navy and the merchant marine and the relationship that that had to the city of London or you know, other major international uh, centers of finance, which allowed those two to work in conjunction and in modern warfare to limit or to control the sinews of war. It's not a quick strategy. It's not a, a very militaristic strategy, but it certainly is one which had proven to be resilient and have great enduring capacity to be effective in the British system. 
the question is, can you bring the Americans into this system? So let me start in 1937 with the, with the actual declaration, if you will, of, of Japan as the enemy in the Far East through its activities now in China. And I would disagree, I think, with Andy in the sense of the, the idea of it not being uh, important or not, not that it wasn't important. The idea of Japan would not be there for any enduring time. Actually, in both Britain and the United States, the strategic assessment and the word that is used, it's, ironically enough, the word that is used independently in both Washington and in London, and which will go on into the vocabulary of American imperial policy or interventionist policy following the Second World War is that of quagmire. Both British and American appreciations of the Chinese role in of the Japanese role in China is that of a wearing down and a continuous drain on Japanese blood, treasure, and most importantly, political will, and the hoped for switch of governments and the movement away from militarism to perhaps a more moderate Japanese government that would be more conducive to some of the deterrent, uh, deterrent being demonstrated by the West. This quagmire is seen as being the way for the third way in which to be able to not only wear down Japan, but fix it and fix it and keep it from actually being able to do any adventurism in the Southern China Seas or in any of the Southern axis, Southern flank issues. And I would argue that this is quite a successful strategy and it's a successful strategy due to two, two, two core elements. One is that despite Japanese naval dominance in the areas that, that Andy so, so accurately pointed out in many ways, one of the things that cannot be done by the Japanese is for it to be able to effectively interdict and to blockade Japan, China in its totality. It is incrementally able to do so, which eventually will lead to the create or the need for the creation of the Burma Road to offset then the loss of the continued access to China that uh, had traditionally been the way to be able to support it. But because that is an incremental movement, the ability to build up China to a, a degree and then also be able to uh, provide materials is, is allowable for a fair amount of time to make it credible as, a, as this quagmire, to help it become this quagmire. More importantly than that is the ability, of course, for the maritime driven economies of the United States and Great Britain to be able to raise the finances and to create a number of loans, two separate set of loans between 1937 and 1940 that are financing the Chinese. And then of course, later on Lend-Lease will have a, a Chinese element to it. But before that, it's important to understand that these loans to China are joint Anglo-American creations. The complex the complexity and the intricacy of how it is that the two work together to be able to arrive at the way in which the loans will work, how they'll be targeted and amounts is, is absolutely uh, fundamental to this growing trust and the dynamic of how the two states collaborate in the Asia Pacific. And therefore, being able to do lots of time the story you know it's Chenault and the flying tigers or it's some kind of individual uh, aspiration by a state it's not these things of course take place but ironically enough Ch Chenault's p40s are p40s that are first earmarked for australia and then actually given over and written off by well, largely britain and then then australia agrees to allow those aircraft to go and do what they do there so there's always these connectivities if you will even of resource in the coordination of the two states. So these loans are critical and fundamental to understanding the, the role and also in terms of the maritime domain being allowed to generate the power to do so. And then of course, access. And even if the materials come from Russia, they still have to be paid. And where do the Chinese get the money to pay for that? Well, certainly not Russia. And therefore even Russian materials are bought on the basis of Anglo-American finance. The other element of this is, of course, the economic warfare against Japan proper. 
which ranges in you know traditional literature we understand the growing kind of escalation of sanctions and then which eventually in July of 1941 the final kind of step too far the freezing um, it's interesting that in both cases particularly in the United States there is there is no desire for this kind of idea of what Britain had practiced in the First World War, which of course is blockade and a maritime element to this. This will all be sanctions and embargoes and economic warfare at distance, but without the fundamental building blocks, which the British example previous to that had put into place, which was a credible naval force to be able to actually interdict and do something about it. Here, though, geography does work to the advantage of both Britain and the United States, again, being able to coordinate even a distant blockade as opposed to a close blockade, which the Malaya barrier would have been a part of. Because apart from the Dutch East Indies oil, which of course would be critical, and the rubber plantations, all those access, accessible and quickly accessible raw materials, that's fine, but where would Japan get the money to be able to continue a modern industrial war? And it's here that the links between Japan and Latin America are critical, as well as into other, other parts of the world. Largely, the parts of the world that are linked to both the United States and Great Britain. But their maritime or naval power actually will allow the interdiction and will allow the interference with Japanese shipping at distance because Japan has to come to them. So how does the system work actually is one of the things that we need to understand. How does the legality of this create the ability to keep a deterrent effect, but at the same time, try to prevent escalation. And here it's fascinating. We don't have you know, nearly enough time to go through this, but it is fascinating to look at the way from September of 1939, all the way through to the freezing point in July of 1941, how the British, uh, the growth of British uh, missions in Washington, which creates basically a, a little London in Washington, as all of these missions grow and grow. One of the earliest in and one of the largest is is basically a mission which will transfer all of the knowledge and all of the capability that was earned in the First World War about how to put into place a blockading system, particularly things like nav certs and the way in which blacklist, blockade lists, rationing lists, that whole panoply of the legal way of implementing economic warfare at sea takes place is transferred over and, and put into the various elements of the United States system, be it the Treasury, be it particularly the State Department and into the United States Navy itself. But ironically enough, it's the United States Navy itself, which is the least prepared and the least interested in this kind of a thing, because that's not where it wants to be. So even when President Roosevelt in 1940 is talking about trying to interdict Japanese shipping in mid-Pacific or someplace, you know, if it slips through the the Millie Barrier and places like that. The answers that are coming back are, of course, one, based on truth. The United States Navy is not capable of doing that. It does not have links to a merchant marine that can be turned into sorts of kind of blockading cutters, as you would have seen, say, with the 8th or 10th cruiser squadrons in World War I by the Royal Navy. It certainly doesn't have enough long range aircraft to be able to inter interdict and to be able to monitor. And it certainly doesn't have light cruisers or those kinds of ranging vessels, nor enough aircraft carriers to be able to cover the distances involved as well. But that, that's irrelevant because it doesn't have to cover all of the Pacific. This is trade, this is not a battle group. We don't have to find it, we know where it's coming to. You need to be able to position your, your assets at the proper kind of choke point where those will come to a port or to a nation and its international waters and be able to do it there. But even still, it's, it's not capable. So in other words, the Royal Navy's capability in this regard has been run down for all of the reasons that Andy put forward. And so therefore its ability to do this is badly damaged. And the United States Navy is not interested in doing it, but nonetheless, both pursue a higher policy of, of economic warfare and deterrence 
which demands that there be naval power underneath and underpinning that to give it credibility. And this is where CNC US Fleet Admiral J.O. Richardson kind of comes unstuck, if you will, with the president um, and will eventually be relieved because he does not believe that the United States fleet in Pearl Harbor is having that deterrent effect on the Japanese to be able to allow these kind of activities to take place with anything other than a guarantee that there will be escalatory actions that will result in war. Uh, and he's quite, you know, quite straightforward and quite scathing about just exactly how unbalanced what it is that all of these economic warfare elements are doing in terms of the political and diplomatic and the economic elements, but it's out of whack with what it is that the United States can actually perform with its Navy. And therefore, you know, he calls for a far greater kind of understanding, if you will, I suppose, of the limitations. And therefore, this is where the, the kind of expectation, I think, of the, of the exp expeditionary nature and the raiding nature of what might happen in 1942 between the United St or the Royal Navy and the United States Navy comes to, to, some, to have some traction. But with Richardson's departure, um, I don't think that that would probably be very likely. Control is definitely then invested, you know, Betty, Betty Stark, CN, the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Betty Stark, you know, admits to Richardson that in this kind of game of escalation and, and as the Japanese bite low hanging fruit from the rotten European empires that are now left to crumble in the Far East, uh, there is no solution to this because American forces are very much an all or nothing kind of thing. There is no intermediary, immediate kind of position for them to be able to operate from. And this is why then the need to go forward and move away in terms of the other option within or, or, war plan or the more forward basing presence in the Philippine is seeing all, all of a sudden as being uh, preferable. But by this point, this is of the say now the, the fall and early of the 1940 and early 1941, the situation and the dynamic has changed. If you start to do that, at one hand, you are trying to deter through these economic means and create a, a deterrent strategy. But then if you're now going to move and trying to press forward and have a forward presence, how will that deter? It's obviously escalatory on the one hand to do this. So there would be a, a even more massive schizophrenia if a forward deployment of naval assets would have taken place. And this is where then air power is seen as perhaps being a panacea. And we can start to look at the idea of putting forward the B-17s and a greater amount of air power to be able hopefully to work with British submarines or other units of the Dutch and the British to be able to create some kind of, of deterrent effect in terms of, of economic, economic warfare, but also in terms of a signal. Uh, but you know, operationally, there are good relations from 1935 up until 19, up until the outbreak of actual war in 1941 between the China squadron and the uh, American Asiatic fleet. There is local codes are created and made, information is shared. They actually operate and do have operational exercises that are not operational exercises that are are seen as being formal. But what you do see is the ability for these to, to translate into having some kind of operational understanding of one another. And when it's seen that, you know, the, that as part of this economic warfare that the Asiatic fleet would maybe get four old cruisers to help boost, bolster it's a, this question of where basing should take place. Well, the British are interested to get the Americans to base out of Singapore. They don't care if it's a tugboat, all they wanna do is have the signal to be able to say that, look, the Americans work with us when we work with them. And we, they want a very open and overt kind of, of signal for that to take place. This is why you don't have American delegates to the Singapore naval talks that take place. Uh, you have observers, but you don't have actual former formal American participation in the sense of having a, a participant that by name is there. And certainly in terms of the, 
the outcome of that, those are immediately shared, obviously, and distributed throughout the, you know, the United States Navy quite, quite quickly. And it's clear in the testimony, the Pearl Harbor testimony, uh, Admiral Stark's you know, kind of scathing idea that the war plans that are being made in Singapore, um, I forget the exact phrasing where, you know, the usual kind of uh, British uh, the unreality basically of the condition that faces them, but also the idea that as soon as President Roosevelt is reelected that the United States will automatically then now therefore be at war. So they do understand though that the allied objective of both is to economically starve the Japanese ability to wage war. And I would argue that the, the way in which the naval power is being oriented to do that is correct. And it's not just about fighting the next Trafalgar or the next Jutland or about actually the next Midway. But what you're seeing is the ability to get these units. That's why it doesn't matter that Zed is a, a fleet unit that can conduct major operations in a fleet battle. It's not there to do that. It's there to help to cover and to be in addition to the other forces and the other units that should be there to start to wage this economic warfare and the strangulation and the erosion of even more of the Chinese, the Japanese ability to continue to, to create wealth and to generate any kind of modern industrial war. I believe that that's also what it is that leads to Pearl Harbor. There are two critical events, I think, that make Pearl Harbor, Pearl Harbor. One is the fact that Japanese perceptions of what it is that they face is a combined joined up and a relatively united Anglo-American front on the maritime economic, uh, in the ec maritime and economic spheres. And it's fear of that, which keeps them from just taking what they believe they could have in the way that they had gobbled up uh, French and other you know, European possessions is what keeps them from going after the Dutch and the British low hanging fruit is, is that if that happens, they do believe the Americans will be pushed now to finally take that action because there is that agreement and that understanding. So that is the, the antithesis, if you will, to the Pact of Steel. There is the Pact of the Sea, which is the Anglo-American Pact. And the other, of course, and we don't have time to fit this in, which is one of the other big threat to China or to Japan has always been Russia. And when you have Barbarossa in the sum, spring summer of 1941, followed then by the freezing of assets in July of 1941, there is very little choice now left to the Japanese in terms of what they can do with their naval power, which is going to shrink and demonstrably shrink year by year by year, as well as, as its air power, is that you have to use it or you will lose that card. Because both the British and the American industrial capability is now starting to flex itself. And certainly in terms of what the quagmire of China has done, well, yes, there are stockpiles and there are critical strategic raw materials that have been put away for a rainy day, all of the Japanese assessments know just exactly what, what they have to do in that year. They can't win a war in China in a year, but what they can do is perhaps win enough battles to be able to cause some sort of peace to be declared. And therefore that's why a risk gamble strategy has to now be the one that takes itself forward. So within all of this, the sea and the maritime domain is absolutely fundamental. It's the platform upon which I would argue a united Anglo-American front has been created, not declared and not obvious, and therefore the best of those kinds of things, which is an unknown unknown. And the other is, is that of course the economic power that both America and the United uh, Great Britain can still draw on globally is, is enough for that to be the critical factor for the Japanese to have to take into account when they decide their way forward. So that's enough from myself. And I will now quickly move down to the chat box and we will start there. So I think this is from John Cullen and he says, hi, Andy, do you feel that had the army 
been able to hold the north of Malaya longer, maybe even a long siege of Penang, fortification built in 1940-41, supported by the Royal Navy from the Indian Ocean, might have changed the Royal Navy's ability to reinforce hold Singapore. Um, I think um, the interesting issues here are, um, um, I mean, the British had what they've got in, uh, in Malaya at the, at the outbreak of war. Um, could they have done better in uh, uh, keeping the, the Japanese at bay, um, at least initially, undoubtedly? And of course, if they'd exercised um, Operation Matador and uh, moved into the Kra Isthmus as uh, uh, war plans anticipated, um, uh, their position again would have been uh, uh, greatly strengthened. But um, as, as you move beyond the first, the first uh, few weeks, um, both sides um, are going to have to uh, uh, sustain their forces in the field and, of course, bring in reinforcements. And it seems to me, therefore, the, the, there the Japanese have uh, enormous uh, advantages. I mean, they're, they're operating on uh, much more interior lines, now not without risk, but um, they've got lots of options available to them. Um, so I think if they, if they were held back a bit in, in Malaya, I think they would have been tempted to, uh, to adjust their, uh, their overall uh, uh, plan for the, uh, the Southern offensive and perhaps brought forward um, um, uh, aspects of the invasion into the uh, Netherlands East Indies with a view to, uh, to cutting Britain's supply lines and, uh, and outflanking uh, any, any defensive moves. Um, so uh, in answer to your question, maybe a bit, but uh, I don't, I think it would have been very difficult for Britain ultimately to hold Malaya um, under any circumstances. Just hide that again. Okay. The um, the question of the the kind of intent part, Andy, I find really interesting in the sense of the all of the plans and all of the planning and all of the thinking that goes into moving ships eventually to some part of the ocean to do some kind of thing. I mean, when when you look at the kind of the balance that you talked about, you know, a failure of, of the risk assessment exercise and, and managing risk. I guess the question about what, uh, what would be a, the fundamental kind of rule out of, out of the, the way in which they were dealing with risk, would you see as being kind of the critical element? Is it is it the political shaping the intelligence, you know, situating the estimate again? Because it seems, you know, that the intelligence picture is, is fairly substantial for, for that risk appreciation to take place. Or is it that there seems to be, you know, just a, a, a wedded kind of determination that there is going to be this one, one way of moving forward, even if it's slightly altered? I, th I think... Um... And I argue this uh, in, in, in my book, that it's easy to forget how things would have looked in the final uh, two to three weeks before the, the outbreak of war. Um, I mean, on the one hand, I think there's, 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 a, there's, a, there's certainly a good understanding of uh, the forces the, the Japanese can bring to bear in theatre. Um, and I don't think there are too many illusions about uh, um, uh, their, their, their air power and, uh, um, and their overwhelming uh, naval superiority immediately in, in theatre. But, but set against that, I think um, um, the two allies, and I'm sort of 
or perhaps one should say three allies. I mean, because we shouldn't forget uh, the Dutch and this, the, the Dutch do bring some uh, um, important small cards to the table. Um, I think if we're, if we're looking primarily on, on, on the naval side, um, Phillips and Hart um, would have um, um, seen a, a number of pieces on the table that would give them some confidence they had uh, they had time in hand. Um, I mean, just looking at uh, the, the balance of naval forces, it, it would have looked uh, uh, closer than historians tend to view it in, uh, uh, in, in, in hindsight. Um, they would have looked at, uh, on the one hand, uh, the Pacific fleet in Pearl Harbor, but then the very substantial uh, um, a Asiatic fleet submarine for submarine forces, which uh, from memory amount to about 30 or a bit more than 30. Um, um, the air forces are beginning to uh, uh, to build up and the Japanese will uh, uh, will know that um, there are the forthcoming British reinforcements uh, arriving uh, with force said um, at the beginning of December, and then a steady uh, uh, movement of, uh, admittedly, older battleships by uh, uh, by the beginning of uh, by the beginning of forty two, um, the Dutch bring a significant submarine contribution. Um, I mean, I can see that um, Phillips and Hart, as they uh, talk together on the sixth of December, would have said. Uh, you know, there's quite a, there's quite a bit here that um, if the Japanese do move in the next few weeks, um, is capable of doing them significant damage. Um, they'll make progress, but um, we've every we've every hope of uh, uh, containing them before they do too much damage. Um, now, I think. Um, what of course they didn't anticipate was you can forget the Pacific fleet because that's taken out. Um, uh, MacArthur's um, uh, Philippines forces inexcusably are um, eliminated um, a day later. Um, and um, those wonderful 23 modern submarines um, with the Asiatic fleet really do nothing very much. And again, inexcus inexcusably, all of them um, are alongside on the 8th of December, which um, in the wake of Pearl Harbor seems quite remarkable. And I mean, not just what's happened at Pearl Harbor, but all the warning intelligence over the previous, uh, over the previous 10 days. Um, so, so suddenly from Phillips's point of view on the 8th of December, having uh, two days earlier thought that um, um, there's a limited but still reasonable defensive package here, almost all of it's gone. And um, he's left with uh, a very thin force said, and the decision, do I go north and uh, at least have a go at uh, interdicting um, uh, the landings with all the risks that that involves. Yeah, it's. I think it's interesting in the sense of seeing Pearl Harbor. I mean, obviously an American tragedy, but the centrality of so many things that rested upon Pearl Harbor that are not American. It's it's not just their their war. It's not just their you know kind of concern that now has been tied to what happens on December seventh. There's so many of these other things that rested upon obviously the existence of that fleet but also i suppose in in many ways the the kind of continued neutrality of the united states i mean to make to make some of the leaps i suppose in terms of the consolidation of of things into a reality i mean it's it's quite clear that there the, you know the the kind of thing about how long would any kind of of the preparations that we're talking about have been allowed to go on if there is no no Pearl Harbor. Does it exacerbate things in such a to such a degree uh, 
you know that in many ways you see that as being the only the only solution that the Japanese really have left to them, or you know do they preempt what could have been you know a a, a change in conditions that would have would have allowed you know maybe a, a different type of peace, but certainly some kind of peace to been to settled with them with regard to China and maybe even possessions of Indochina, places like that. So I think I think the, the the attack on Pearl Harbor and the actual activities of Pearl Harbor itself, that's one of the reasons why I would say that it, it's it's good to look at it as more than just the uh, the American experience. Really, it has to be seen as being a wider kind of an event than than just the United States' entry into war. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, uh, that that's right. Um, and I think really right up to the to the outbreak of war. I mean, um, I mean, despite all the uh, admiralty plans for creating a new uh, eastern fleet and uh, deploying it offensively, I mean, at the political level, it's about limiting um, limiting commitment and uh, limiting uh, li liabilities, um, and. Uh, through all of 1941, of course, uh, Churchill has been uh, the driving force to give priority to uh, uh, to the Middle East and that that Western boundary of uh, the Eastern Empire, uh, as as I see it. But but of course, Churchill's not just thinking defensively; he's thinking about uh, um, the opportunities it, it it may offer in the future. Um, and even when it becomes clear that Japan is likely to move, I think at the political level, I mean, there's the whole uh, 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 deterrence. Um, 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 there's the initial deterrence idea, but uh, but it's all about doing doing a minimum um, to uh, uh, keep the Japanese uh, uh, Japanese in check. Um, I mean, perhaps we should also mention, I think uh, Churchill and to some extent, um, the Admiralty expects the Japanese to be, to be relatively cautious. Um, all right, they're gonna move, they're gonna move south, but of course it's gonna be step by step. And that takes us in on the one hand to the famous, uh, is it gonna be Thailand or are they going to go straight to Malaya? And, uh, um, I think there was probably a, um, an attractive uh, um, consensus that uh, they'd, they'd, they'd go for Thailand first. I mean, maybe only briefly, but it will, uh, it will provide uh, a little bit of a breathing space and perhaps create some options. Um, and, and of course, the fixation about uh, raiding in the Indian Ocean, which the Japanese certainly could have done, I mean, they had all the forces available to do that, and and it would have been uh, and it would have been very damaging. But um, we now know that the Japanese never anticipated pursuing such a such a strategy. I mean, it just wasn't part of their uh, uh, their war making uh, uh, ethos. Mm -hmm. um, so I think these these thoughts all play into. Uh, um, into how the British uh, play those those final weeks, and yeah. um, perhaps the last thing we should say, of course, they are. I mean, I mean, Churchill certainly, but equally the chiefs of staff are terrified that uh, um, if they precipitate a move by Japan, and the U.S. do not come in, um, they'll be left in a very difficult uh, difficult position. So again, there's there's reluctance to uh, to do anything preemptive, and uh, and ultimately, most importantly, I, I think that bears on Brooke Popham and his reluctance to move into the Krar Isthmus because he's not sure he's got the political cover to do that. Yeah, uh, John, do you feel do you feel the U.S. would have been able to come to British support had the Japanese just attacked the British? That's a <laughs> that is. That is a great question, and it is certainly one when you see 
London ask the rest of the Commonwealth to actually now buy into the freezing assets system. All of the Commonwealth comes back, all of the telegrams are exactly that question. Yes, we will do it. Yes, we'll go sign up to the freezing orders. Yes, we'll participate in this, but we want to have the confirmation or we want to have the assurance that if we therefore then are the ones that by doing this create, you know, a Japanese attack, that the United States is going to, to then come to our support. Uh, so this sets off a flurry of activity, obviously, between London, Washington, getting assurances, making it, it would go down as being one of the biggest, biggest, biggest betrayals of any sort, uh, if that had not happened. And I mean, in, again, this kind of counterfactual history, I always find quite ironic. What, what would have been the advantage if, you know, the Japanese attack had been that, just try and take the last little bits of low hanging fruit and the Dutch Netherlands, East Indies for the oil. And of course, then with the capture of Singapore, the atrocities of Singapore, you make sure that there's the odd American ship that might get in the way to create your Gulf of Tonkin type incident or, you know, USN Rubin type incident again. And instead you don't need Pearl Harbor. Now you have an intact American fleet. Now you have an intact American Pacific everything. Uh, can you then go forward and do you see that this is, would it have been better, I guess, in the long run, if that had actually been what had had to happen? And I think actually, if it had been that, that would have been actually much more to script of both sides of uh, the equation. But yes, I, I believe, I believe that this, that I believe the Churchill's government would not have gone ahead and done the freezing order, no matter how badly they knew they needed to stay in step with the United States for the war in Europe, for all of the reasons that the British war effort needed the United States. I don't believe that it would have gone ahead with supporting. And actually, it's the British that come up with the concept of the freezing order, not the timing, but it's a British concept, the whole freezing asset, the whole freezing order concept. And it's uh, therefore, yes, I would, I would say that they did expect that the United States would support them in that condition. David Page has got for everyone. So was there an option to deter the Japanese that the UK could have done? Example, move ja submarines back. Could Japan have fought just the UK and Commonwealth? I am mindful that US troop ships delivered part of UK division to Singapore a week before Pearl Harbor. Andy? Um. I think I would argue, I mean, Britain had options in, uh, uh, in, in, in the autumn of 1941 to uh, reinforce the Far East at, at the expense of, of, of the Middle East. And, uh, and again, I, I, I look at this a bit in my, in, 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 in my book um, um, at, at key points, um, August or July, August, September, um, uh, would it have been possible to send, say, four squadrons of fighters and four squadrons of bombers to uh, um, to uh, to Malaya, um, and uh, perhaps um, add um, um, some accelerated uh, naval reinforcements as well? Um, I think the, the the problem with getting into those counterfactuals is uh, they of course come at a price um, um, in um, um, the front line in the Western Desert where uh, uh, they're building up for the Crusader for the Crusader offensive, and uh, and I think you can certainly argue that uh, if Britain had withdrawn those forces, I mean Crusader was a very closely fought battle. It um, it might have turned uh, a narrow win into, uh, at best, stalemate; at worst, um, something something of a defeat. Um, and uh, Churchill, as the driving political force and uh, commanders on the ground, would would have been aware that uh, they were operating to 
uh, to fairly a fine margin, so there would have been deep reluctance to, to see major diversion to uh, a theatre which is not yet at war. Now, even if it had happened and uh, you get uh, four fighter squadrons and four um, relatively modern uh, bomber uh, squadrons, would that have made um, that much difference? I mean, the Japanese um, could have increased um, uh, their, their force levels for uh, the southern attack to take account of that uh, um, of that reinforcement. And um, as I said in answer to um, um, John Cullen's earlier question, they could reinforce much more quickly than uh, than uh, than Britain could, and they had much more in the way of options to uh, uh, to alter their attack plan to to make life more difficult for. For Britain by uh, uh, moving earlier into uh, the, the Netherlands East Indies and conducting a, a, a flanking maneuver and making sure that no further reinforcements came in. Um, I see there's a reference to submarines. Um, I mean, I certainly one, I think possibly two submarines um, did reach Singapore. Um, shortly before its uh, uh, fall and one of them trusty conducted a patrol into uh, um, the, Gulf, the Gulf of Siam without any uh, significant impact. Um, I mean, again, any further submarine reinforcements had to come from the Mediterranean and that would have been at, uh, at a cost where um, the Mediterranean fleet was uh, operating to quite uh, fine fine margins. Um, anything coming from UK, if they were available, I mean the time scales are, are far too far too long to get any significant force in theatre for it to be for it to be useful. So I think overall my answer is um, without a major shift in strategy and essentially a, a decision to adopt. Uh, um, a strictly defensive stance in, in, in the Middle East, uh, pullback not just to the Egyptian border, but uh, somewhat east of that, um, and um, forego any prospect of offensive operations for the foreseeable future with all the implications that would involve. Um, I just don't think it was possible to hold Malaya and Singapore. Yeah, I mean, the submarine question is interesting because many of the submarines that move into the Mediterranean to try and help out there, of course, they're sunk. They aren't, they aren't going to come back because they're not appropriate for the Mediterranean. The submarines, many of the submarine types are, are specific to region and the ones that are in the Pacific are a bit bigger, a bit more to them. Uh, and when they're in the Mediterranean, in the shallower waters, clearer waters, they show up quite easily to particularly Italian and German air. And so therefore you see a high number of losses of, of those submarines that come from the Singapore squadrons into the Mediterranean. Uh, and, you know, it, as Andy says, you just, it's just not that easy to, to all of a sudden pick them up and move them out there with the margins that already the Navy's working with within the Mediterranean and in these these types of, of ships. So I think that the idea to deter J the Japanese, what else could they have done? Would have had uh, more, I suppose, to do with the levels and the escalation of the kinds of, of things that they would have done faster in terms of declaring even greater numbers and larger amounts of sanctions and embargoes and the withdrawal of, you know, financial access and things like that instead of the pace at which they did but again this this comes down to having to understand that this is a joint effort the uk really cannot do many of those kinds of things unless they're in step with the americans about this because there's a great deal of fear about one being put out in front of the other or one being left behind so the need to coordinate these and and that takes time so this is not a really speedy, this is not as I would argue, 
autonomous decision-making process as it often is lend itself to be presented as. This is not just a, a dialogue within the Royal Navy and London or you know British system. The dialogue is taking place constantly with, and then once you know the the war increases through 1940 and 41, the volume and the amount of integration of these things is becoming greater and greater. And of course, that is sand in the machinery because the machinery that we don't that you see in the actual war once it's declared, in if you want to call it this kind of pre <laughs> another phony war, the Anglo-American phony war from 39 to the end of 41. All of that growth of this machinery and the, the dialogue and the, the interaction that I'm talking about is not is not conducive to rapid and quick decision making, and that is one of the problems. Is, is that 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 is that is one of the things that for those that are critical about kind of the speed of a, of, of British decision making, well, you have to see that as as now no longer a a, a unit a, a sovereign body. And therefore, that is one of the reasons and one of the things. So even in terms of these kinds of questions about, you know, movements of units and stuff like that, there has to be conversations that take place because it could be interfering with the other actor or the way in which these units were going to be or could be used for other kinds of purposes or even just symbolic gestures. The type of capability. If you only move a submarine, why don't you move a capital ship, you know? Take, for example, the modern day. Why has the new Queen Elizabeth been spent the last, you know, months cruising around the South China Seas and the Asia Pacific? Well, it's there to demonstrate that Britain is a, a serious power in the region. Okay, well, you can't do that with submarines. You can't do that with things that don't get seen. So same kind of thing applied at that particular time. Um. I think I would just, uh, it's interesting to actually pursue the submarine uh, issue uh, um, a little bit further. I mean, I've uh, referred to it a, a couple of times already. Um, I mean, the Americans and the Dutch between them have a, have a significant force. The Americans have 23 uh, very modern submarines, the latest classes, which are very well adapted to uh, uh, Pacific operations. Um, they also have, um, I think, I think ten older submarines that are of more limited military value. The Dutch have uh, about twelve boats, of which six again, so half of them are again modern and uh, uh, well suited to uh, um, operations in 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 this theatre. Um, and there is a fascinating question. So if you take um, around thirty modern well-equipped boats why didn't they achieve achieve more um, now the dutch don't do too badly i think the 12 uh, uh, dutch submarines uh, take out about uh, 12 uh, uh, japanese uh, tran transports um, i mean that's uh, uh, not a great balance but um, um, but it deserve it deserves some note um, the American force does very, very little. Um, I think they take out about uh, uh, three Japanese transports. And, and there is a fascinating question. I know somebody's uh, just completing a, a thesis on this subject. Why did they um, perform so badly? Um, um, why did those 23 boats in the Asiatic fleet uh, fail, uh, fail to deliver. Um, and uh, I mean, essentially, the, uh, the answer is uh, poor, poor leadership, uh, poor training, um, and just not being prepared for any type of war, and certainly not the one that uh, they ended up, they ended up fighting. Um, but as a counterfactual, if um, the overall uh, uh, framework had been there to make use of these ally allied submarines effectively, with the Dutch uh, coming under um, RN uh, control, at least in part, um, 
and um, if they had all performed uh, um, eff effectively, um, they would have made life pretty difficult for the Japanese because the, the Japanese attack plan was very finely calibrated. I mean, they were operating to quite slim, uh, uh, slim margins. Um, the, uh, the overall framework for uh, attacking first Malaya, then uh, successive parts of the Netherlands, East Indies, and of course the Philippines depended on uh, uh, carefully reusing uh, uh, certainly transports, but also uh, many, many of their forces in a very uh, uh, finely tuned and synchronized way. Now, if you start taking out transports uh, in, in, in a serious way, that was going to upset the planning and uh, just possibly provide the Allies with a significant uh, breathing space. It might have made it possible to uh, uh, certainly hold uh, a line somewhere in uh, in the in the Netherlands, East Indies, if not uh, in in Malaya or, or, or Singapore. Um, so that's an interesting um, counterfactual thought. Um, on the air side, I do find it remarkable how little attention is given to what happened in the Philippines compared to Pearl Harbor. Um, I mean, a day, two days after Pearl Harbor, the Japanese are apparently able to catch um, the not insignificant uh, bomber and fighter forces in the Philippines completely by surprise and virtually, virtually take them out. And I do think that does seem rather inexcusable. And uh, I'm not sure what happened has ever really been adequately scrutinized. The, okay, we got two, John Cullum, you feel that the political position is determined at Placentia Bay in fear of a Russian collapse with an increasingly aggressive stance to Japan. I think Placentia Bay is a, is just a confirmation of many things. And I mean, it's particularly important for getting the, the kind of direction, or at least a, a public political statement of direction. But there are, I find there are a whole bunch of kind of inconsistencies in many of the things that we take as a given about, you know, the Second World War, and we just kind of assume that that the, that it was so. So I mean, things like you know the the Declaration of Europe first. Well, that might be true for the American Army. It might be true for the American Air Force. Although, discuss how much money the B twenty nine program takes how much the atomic bomb, and you could argue the atomic bomb could be work, used in both theaters, so that's not fair. Or discuss the growth of the United States Navy and the whole West Coast of the United States compared to the East Coast of the United States, which are already relatively developed. And if you look at the kind of economics of this, is Europe really first for the United States? You know, if, if you're looking at an amount of money and kind of things spent and the political capital wherewithal, is it? But I think I think that the political position in Placentia Bay, you know, is about making sure that Europe Europe is seen to be what it is that is going to be the the Great Crusade, uh, and I think it does speak to the, the closeness of the Anglo-American alliance at this point because I think Roosevelt could have quite easily, you know, have made a case for the you know, the Americans to lead in one theater and say, you know, the British lead in another theater, which of course then would have put the British in a very hard position to be able to lead in that European theater without American support. So who actually, who actually would have led in that theater still would have been the United States providing the leadership in terms of, of material. So I think Placentia Bay does what, you know, is already expected in many ways. It's not it's not a great revelation. It's just kind of a confirmatory thing. And what will happen now is that, you know, it will, it will now go to plan as, as, as has been discussed, but it has not been openly articulated to anybody apart from those within a very close knit and, and very kind of elite part of the Anglo-American strategic uh, 
relationship. David Page's point about the QE and the visit. Yeah, I'm one of the ones who would argue that certainly the role of the American, or sorry, the role of British aircraft carriers is to let the American aircraft carriers actually refresh, replenish, recharge, recore. Um, so, but doesn't mean you can't do two things for the price of one. My caveat to that, much like American British relations over carriers in the mid to late part of the Pacific War, make sure that you can act like a CVN. If you talk the talk, they expect you to walk to walk. And if you repeat, you know, Somerville's experience of showing up with kit on flight decks that don't work, they aren't interested in fairly swordfish and whatever else. And if you have to get Corsairs and Hellcats and TBFs and all the rest to make yourselves efficient. How efficient are you? You're just providing a hull. You're not actually carrier fit. Which speaks to your second part. Why is it it's not the United States Navy and it's the United States Marine Corps that put the F-35s on board? It's because it's much more likely that they're the ones that are going to be far more compatible with you in terms of the ones as you provide a platform. That they will be the ones that will be requiring this platform. And you know the US, United States Navy's platforms are already there. I think it's interesting, you know, this idea of Commonwealth or Imperial navies. If you can, you know, you look at the last stages of the the Second World War in the Pacific, and how integrated the United States, the Royal Navy, and the United States Navy are in carrier operations and things like that. You are, you know, you kind of see that return. I think that is taking place. So you, and it, it, ironically enough, during the last couple weeks of the cruise, you had not only United States Marine Corps and Royal or UK F-35s, but of course you had Italian F-35s. So if you could talk to Canadians and the Singaporeans and the rest of the Commonwealth into buying F-35s, you could run around with your mobile airport and say, hey, just put, a, put an air wing on it and we're good to go. But I think in many ways, this is, you know, you look back at the kind of history of this thing, the ABDA history and the ability to interact and interoperability that, you know, Andy is speaking to here and the kind of leadership, it's still not clear to me at all. You know, I mean, it ends up being a Dutch admiral in charge of ABDA and all the rest for political reasons, things like that. But that that's kind of circumstance to the, I, I'm still not convinced who it was that actually would have led a you know, in a non-Pearl Harbor world, who would have taken an ab the force, as we have kind of discussed, was in the idea and the concept of maturing, and where that those lines of operations would have would have rested. So it's still lots of fast. I guess my final point would be that the, there is ton for for those who think that this is a dead topic and there is nothing left to be done out there. There is so much that has yet to be done. I would argue, it's not the 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 proper term, but to be done right, as opposed to have been done more nationalistically, um, then, then we, we know. And until we do that, we don't really know the real kind of thing that was going on in that part of the world, which is why I'm so grateful, you know, Andy's books that have come out to, to, to clarify and, and work through a lot of that stuff. I noticed by the time that we were already a good 10 minutes over when we were supposed to end, which is a good sign, I think, of, well, it's a good sign either we talk a lot or we just can't watch the clock and keep time, keep track. The um, rest with me to just thank you, the faceless audience <laughs> of the webinar, whose names I see. So thank you all very much for, for coming tonight and to, to sticking with us. Throughout this, I hope that uh, you'll keep an eye on future Corbett activities and, and join us again. And to uh, thank Andy for joining us here tonight and making this an absolutely really splendid event and, uh, and really put uh, the December 7th kind of story into, I think, a lot better context and a lot better understanding of, of the totality of the picture as it existed on that day. So thank you very much, Andy. I look. Look forward to meeting you in the flesh for a pint at some point, as opposed to well, that, just... uh, that sounds uh, that sounds great. It's been a pleasure to be here, um, and I certainly agree with you that there's still lots uh, that uh, needs to be done. Brilliant. Thank you, Danny.
Danny McDivitt, our always behind the scenes communications officer for getting us up here and in place. And thank you all once again. Take care, stay safe, and uh, we will see you again, hopefully, on these webinars in the future. All the best. Good night. Good night.